director of the Hellenic Aviation Society and professor at the University of Aegean. Good evening. Brian Pierce, chief economist from IATA, International Air Transport Association. Brian is a regular of the GAUS workshop. And Jeff Poole, senior vice president of advocacy of the World Travel and Tourism Council, who's joining us from the Netherlands. So, without much further ado, we'll ask Brian to present to us the effect of COVID on the industry. Brian, to you. Thank you very much. And um, hello, everybody. Let me just uh, share my my screen and um, I'm setting the context uh, here. I'm going to look into the implications uh, of COVID-19 with a focus um, on, on air travel um, and tourism. Um, I guess the first point is that um, if we look at what's happened to global air travel measured by uh, the passenger kilometers flown, which is the blue line, you know, we've seen an extraordinary uh, collapse. We've essentially seen in April, um, air, air transport uh, was grounded. Um, you know, it was down uh, 95%. Uh, um, the good news is that in May we saw some improvement, but as you can see, you know, it's been a relatively modest um, improvement, um, uh, particularly modest compared to what's happened to business confidence. And Basically, these measures of business confidence are often quite a good guide to global GDP growth, which is obviously a key driver for tourism and, and air travel. So, you know, there's an interesting question as why haven't we seen more of a rebound um, in global air travel? Um, I mean, what we have seen in those May figures is really that uh, all of the action, all of the travel has been in domestic markets, in particular in the Chinese domestic market, which, as you can see, has been recovering for a few months now and is at a level around about 50% compared to where it was a, a year ago. And there's a tiny bit of a rise in the US, but internationally, you can see all the international regions, which are all bunched together at the bottom, absolutely no movement at all. And that's the thing. We've seen domestic travel as lockdowns start to end. Nothing in the figures um, in, in May. And that's because um, if we look at the a map showing, essentially showing the travel restrictions, uh, we're only now in the last few weeks really starting to see significant relaxation of, uh, of travel restrictions, um, particularly here in Europe uh, with some of the travel corridors and the travel bubbles uh, that we're, we're starting to take place. So this is the sort of the key reason why you haven't seen that rebound despite some of the rebound in business confidence uh, because actually governments are restricting um, that. We're, we're starting uh, to, to see that, um, that unlock. Um, but there is also um, another factor to bear in mind because actually some governments, um, particularly in Europe, um, did relax travel restrictions. They opened international borders um, in April. Um, but what we've seen when we survey passengers is that um, uh, travelers are just as concerned about uh, the risk of quarantine or the requirement of quarantine as they are of catching COVID-19, as you can as you can see from these survey results. And you know, if you look at those markets um, where entry was allowed from April, um, but there was a quarantine required, um, if you look at the bookings that took place for travel in the month of May, you can see there's, there's absolutely no difference between those markets and those that had a full travel ban. The reason some of these numbers are more than 100% down is because they include refunds as well as, uh, as, well as, uh, as new bookings. So quarantine um, is a really big issue um, uh, if, if we're to get tourism uh, going again. Um, so May was the sort of latest solid data that we, we have, but what we do have is uh, data on both bookings and on flights um, more recently. Um, and as you can see, um, we've got data here up to the end of last week on, on the number of flights. Um, 
This does include some cargo flights. Uh, obviously, this doesn't tell you how many people are sitting on the seats on those aircraft, but it does show that there was a further improvement um, in June and in early July, particularly on domestic markets. Um, and actually, if you look at the end of the line for international flights, there was uh, the, the first signs of a rise in international travel. And a lot of that um, is actually coming through Europe. We're actually seeing bookings up quite significantly, um, certainly for some countries, countries like Greece and Latvia, um, bookings made in June um, were back to, well, they were 50% down on a year ago, um, which is um, incredibly though, it is to say it was a marked improvement uh, to what we saw uh, previously. Um, what's going on in the wider economy? Because uh, as we know, tourism and air travel is driven very much by what is happening in the wider economy. And, and if you look at the confidence of businesses in both the manufacturing and the services sectors, um, you know, these numbers here give you the sort of latest readings and they're fairly positive uh, for all the gloom that we have, um, there has been a very sharp rebound in the confidence of, of businesses. Um, as you can see, China is back to pre-crisis levels and even in some of the major economies um, uh, outside of, uh, of Asia, we've seen a pretty sharp rebound in May and June from those lows that were hit in April, which were the depths of the of, of the recession. And as I say, these are typically correlated uh, with GDP growth, a key driver for tourism. So, I mean, that's one positive aspect. The trouble is that would typically lead you to think there'll be a lot of business travel, which is critical for most airlines. Um, however, the survey evidence of businesses suggests there's been a big behavioral change. Um, you know, we've not really got any certainty about this until we actually see what happens in practice, but it looks as though you know, many businesses are, are really going to take a fundamental look at their business travel uh, behaviours and practices. And so this sharp rise in confidence, while I think it's good for employment and it's good for GDP, um, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see a surge of business uh, travel. Um, and I, and I guess the, the negative side to this story, looking at some of these measures of confidence, is that um, if you look at consumers in those same countries, um, they are not confident. Um, and I guess given job losses, given the scale of the recession, um, it's not surprising that that's, that's the case. You know, China, we've seen a bit of a pickup in confidence, but not really elsewhere. And Although you know, there's an expectation, certainly, and, what, and we've seen this in the Chinese domestic market, of pent-up demand for visiting friends and relatives, um, that's probably a one-off effect. So in China, we saw a, a plateauing after the initial uh, peak. Um, leisure travel really needs to see a pickup of consumer confidence. And you know, so I think we really need to start to see that business confidence translating into a recovery of jobs. Um, and indeed, you know, there's doubt about that, of course, because many companies are going to be restructuring. Um, and so I think it's critical to keep an eye on what's happening to business confidence. This really makes us think that we're going to see a relatively slow uh, rise uh, recovery in the travel market. And indeed, you know, we, we, we have done some surveys in the last few months, uh, this last one from um, early June, asking um, almost 5,000 passengers uh, or people who had flown in the last year, um, you know, what their, their intentions uh, would be to return to air travel. And if you look at those top two bars, you can see that there are a total of 45% um, say that they would um, either fly immediately or after a month or two. Um, now that's actually a lower number than we when we surveyed people in April, where when it was over 60%. So it's fallen from 60% to 45%. And obviously the, the remainder there are going to wait six months or so or longer. 
um, you know, before they return to travels. So again, you know, I think um, I think this this um, um, you know, extraordinary episode uh, is is going to be different to a typical recession. The, the the move out of the low point is going to be different to a typical recession. In the typical recession, airlines would cut fares to stimulate demand, and that would typically bring people back uh, to travel. I think a key thing here is to restore confidence, um, and that's going to be a sort of critical task, I think, um, to you know a stronger recovery. Um, uh, another feature of what we've seen in the last couple of months is a change in booking behavior. Um, if you look at the first bar here back in May last year, um, you know, the majority of people actually booked their travel for the travel of May um, uh, 20 days, well, actually, no, 11 days or more. 49% uh, booked it more than 20 days ahead. If you look at what's happened this year, uh, people are booking much later, um, more than 40% within three days of travel. So the issue there is that the forward bookings data is giving us, is giving airlines much less visibility of travel um, in, intentions, which makes it very difficult for airlines to schedule uh, services and to know where to put the services on. Um, what I guess what I would say, though, is that... Um, in the long term, we see no reason to think that um, the pre-crisis projections of substantial growth in air travel are not still valid, because the majority of that was coming from the emerging markets, the developing countries. As you can see from this chart, you know, though the typical person in India or Nigeria, even China, does not travel very much compared to those in France, Germany, or the United, United States. And as income levels grow, as living standards rise, you know, in the past, we've seen this, this relationship has been pretty consistent. Um, and so I think that you know, longer term, we should expect to see a significant increase in demand for air, uh, for air travel from, from those emerging markets. However, over the next five years, um, you know, we do think that the travel um, market is going to be rather different to the one that we were expecting um, pre-COVID. The dotted black line shows the projection that we had at the end of last year uh, for global passenger kilometers uh, flown. Um, and you can see from the blue line what, what sort of our, our sort of current expectation is for the sort of baseline uh, forecasts. And you know, we're expecting something like a 50 or a 60% fall this year with a recovery from those April uh, levels, uh, but you know, down an unprecedented amount. Probably won't see a recovery to 2019 levels before 2023. Um, and obviously, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in these numbers because we really are not quite sure about how COVID itself will develop. We've got a scenario there where we have a sort of second wave um, infection, uh, which sets us back, um, you know, three, three to six, six months. Um, but nor are we absolutely sure how governments react. I mean, one of the key challenges that organisations like ourselves and the one that Jeff um, is running is to persuade governments to act in a consistent way and following a consistent set of protocols which you know I think that's encouraging KO have issued a consistent set of health protocols um, but we're getting very different application of them I mean for instance in Australia we've seen them suggesting that um, you know we're not really going to see international travel before next year um, despite a relatively low um, uh, level of cases. Um, and I would emphasize that I think we're not quite out of the woods yet um, with, with the COVID uncertainties. The chart on the left shows the number of cases through to end June. And although in the developed markets, um, you know, we've seen very good progress. And in China, we've seen very good uh, progress. But as you can see, that blue line turns up. That's the US where we've seen 
um, a, a turn up of cases. And obviously in many markets, um, in Latin America in particular, um, but also in, in Africa and, else, and, and elsewhere, we're actually seeing no sign of a peak um, in the cases. And you know, we, we had a look at those emerging markets uh, where there are rising COVID cases, which is the blue segment of the pie chart and the US international market, just looked at what that represented in terms of the air travel market measured by revenue passenger kilometers. And it's, it's almost 40%. And it's quite possible that given those, the direction of those cases, you know, that we could see those markets closed um, for the rest of, of, of this, this year. Um, you know, that has quite a significant effect on our projections. Um, the blue dotted line is, is our sort of baseline on the expectation that some of those markets, particularly in the US, um, would open before the end of the year. If they don't, um, we could be in December where we're still seeing air travel, you know, more than 50% down uh, on a year earlier. So that's the sort of project, the projection. Um, I want to just to finish on the so what question for governments. Um, you know, does, does tourism matter? Um, because we often measure uh, the importance of tourism by the spending of tourists. And, and uh, uh, clearly for you know, economies like the Maldives or Vanuatu or the Barbados, um, it, clearly tourism is absolutely critical for, uh, for their economies. Um, but because um, outbound tourism is more than inbound tourism for China, UK, Singapore, Germany, does that mean that tourism is negative uh, for those economies? You know, I would say absolutely not. Um, so I would, for those academics that are listening to the call, I, I, when we're thinking about the wider benefits of the industry, I'd, I'd um, you know, ask us not to focus where we often have on, on the spending, uh, because I think it gives very misleading um, impressions. And I think what's more important is actually the connections um, that tourism and air transport enables between cities. And you know, one point I think here to make is that, um, you know, if you look at, and this, these are all the trips last year 2019 94% of the trips between cities 94% of the city pair tickets uh, were indirect um, you know the, the people had to make a connection um, now if you look at the the volumes on those routes most people do travel on the trunk markets as you can see from the chart on the right but I think the point is those connecting those cities is, is actually critical for the economic development that takes place, not just through the tourism, but the trade and the investment and some of the softer stuff, you know, the exchange of ideas, competition that takes place. These are the sort of fundamental building blocks of economic development that, you know, air transport, tourism indirectly are really critical for. And the COVID really is endangering those indirect connections. Um, in fact, we, you know, this chart here is the last one. I shall finish after this. I think this is the value proposition of the industry um, to the rest of the world. Um, that, you know, air transport or tourism more generally is provided at lower and lower real cost but has connected more and more cities together. It's connect those bridges, allow flows of, as I say, goods and tourists um, and other, other fundamental building blocks of the economy. And the risk I think that we need to make sure uh, we protect against is that those city pair connections are not permanently uh, degraded because you know, at the moment um, it looks as though we're probably gonna be 25% down uh, the, this year, and that will be, you know, potentially damaging not just for tourism, uh, but for the wider um, economy. And I will finish there and hand back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Before we go to questions, Sharon, would you like to give us a brief overview of how COVID has affected tourism in the Seychelles? Um, lockdown and, and what happened? Yes, 
um, thank you for allowing me to talk first and thank you Brian for um, the presentation which was very insightful and it um, and it just reminded me uh, destination like Seychelles we depend on tourism this is our bread and butter our livelihood and of course just like every other destination um, April and May tourism was uh, basically at zero um, we never thought we would see that day, but it happened. So um, um, for us, um, I would say uh, we blessed to a certain extent that we, we did not get affected as much as a lot of other countries. Um, during the first wave, we got uh, 11 cases and uh, uh, there were no community transmission. Um, most of the cases were incoming, inbound to the country and uh, we managed to contain it. Yes, there was a period of restriction of movement, but by 4th of May, the domestic economy uh, um, was back running and our international airport reopened as of 1st of June. But during this phase, it was more for um, uh, private charters um, basically and uh, more um, going towards um, island resorts because island resorts can act as a sort of uh, quarantine in itself so um, but of course we've had what we call the second wave and it's still um, I would say it's through um, uh, sea crew sailors coming in uh, for the fishing vessel but it's uh, all contained within the fishing vessel uh, still not in the community uh, crossed fingers um, and uh, we intend um, as a result of all the measures and having been cautiously managed the situation um, to uh, reopen to tourism as of 1st of August and when I say reopen to tourism, it's basically be open um, to commercial flight. Already um, two airlines have shown interest to start um, as of the 1st of August, um, which is at least something to start with. We don't expect all of them to be back on our shores uh, um, very fast, knowing how the situation is. And... Uh, uh, in Seychelles, we are really trying to rebuild back the travel confidence by promoting safe travel and safe stay. And what I mean by this is uh, basically um, uh, the country with the public health department, um, uh, we've uh, drawn out a list of low and medium risk countries where we'll be starting to accept uh, visitors. And uh, these visitors um, will be subject to a PCR test that has to be done 72 hours prior to travel and have to be presented at the check-in counter um, uh, for before departure. So it would be um, something uh, we are hoping to get assistance of the airline to be able to put it in force. But of course, they will have to submit um, uh, uh, also to the Department of Public Health, but just submit it for verification. There would be automated response, but uh, just an automated response saying basically acknowledge risk, an acknowledging receipt. And uh, um, arriving in Seychelles, um, visitors may be subject again to a rapid antigen test, but that is uh, if they are showing, say, uh, signs or symptoms of uh, being sick or maybe when they submit the PCR test, the Department of Public Health is not realized that maybe the, the test itself, uh, the laboratory it's done, it does not look authentic. They will decide basically. And a whole series of measures also have been, um, have been established within the country. All operators uh, in Seychelles, tourism operators and service providers, um, basically they have to adapt to a new normal. They have to receive the, um, safe certification before they can start receiving guests or before they can start um, serving guests. So it's like they are getting a license all over again. And um, um, so the idea, like I said, is to promote safe travel and safe stay and, and uh, we know the visitors will come in trickle. We don't foresee a, a big number, um, just like the presentation of, uh, of Brian have shown, um, but it is our livelihood and we have to start somewhere. Um, and this is how we intend to, to start for the, for the time being. Okay.
Thank you, Sherin. From Brian's presentation, we could see that consumer confidence is the biggest issue that should be tackled, and obviously Seychelles has all these measures. So what other measures have been taken? What are other destinations doing? Andreas and Jeff, maybe you can jump in here. Jeff, would you like to go ahead and then I can intervene? Yeah, I'm, um, yeah I'd, I'd like, like to answer that question because I think what, um, what people have been doing is following the, the four principles of recovery that, that we've been advocating. But I'd like to just build on, on uh, Brian's presentation first. He was talking about aviation. I'd like to just say, what have we lost? Where are we now? And then why, why are we advocating for these four measures that all governments and the private sector can take? Travel, before, before COVID-19, travel and tourism was providing uh, 330 million jobs uh, globally. That's one, more than one in 10 of jobs around, around the world. Um, and that also uh, represents more than 10% of global GDP. Importantly, travel and tourism has created one in four of the new jobs over the last five years. So this clearly demonstrates that uh, the travel and tourism industry is a real driver for the, from the global economy. So we've lost a lot of that, as, as Brian chart, Brian's charts show, they dropped to virtually zero. Um, but the corollary is that we know that travel and tourism can be the generator again for a faster and more effective global e economic recovery. Uh, right now, our research shows that if we assume a fairly reasonable uh, recovery from, from COVID-19, we will have lost 121 million jobs. But if that recovery starts later and is at a slower rate, our downside scenario says that's that that will lose 198 million jobs. So between those, uh, you know, reasonable scenario and a downside, there's 77 million jobs and, and over two trillion dollars uh, of GDP that can be lost. So there's a huge prize in terms of getting travel and tourism moving as soon as we can. And there are two two elements of that. One, it, well, three elements. Apart from the medical side and, and making sure that things are safe, there's the removal of travel restrictions and the all important element of the uh, the traveller confidence. So traveller confidence is what everybody needs to be working on. So where are we in terms of uh, working together? Um, four things that we're advocating. One is a, a, a coordinated private and public sector approach to establishing effective operations again. That means not only reopening borders in a coordinated way, taking account of medical, industry and political issues, but also removing the barriers uh, to tourism. And there are still too many visas, but also things like governments issuing uh, only travel and only non-essential travel can prevent um, health, travel insurance and health insurance and that can be a barrier. We need to enhance the passenger uh, experience. We were already going for safe and se seamless travel uh, with use of biometrics and so on. Now we're, now we're integrating the health components of those. Um, before, the vac before there's a widespread vaccine available, that will mean uh, testing and contact tracing, and we're all familiar with the stories around that. And after, but after the vaccine, it will mean that we have to have digital uh, health passports and stamps and so on. Most importantly for the traveller confidence is the issue of am I, am I safe to travel? Some of the questions in the chat room, is it, is it safe to be on an aircraft? And the answer is, has to be absolutely yes. And why? Because the private sector is putting in place the appropriate protocols uh, for public health and safety. And for the first time ever, WTTC has created the private sector protocols for nine different industries within travel and tourism. So, you know, when you go to, a, if you're on an aircraft and you're in an airport, or you're at a hotel, if you're renting a car, if you're in a, a theme, theme park or other attraction, you know, you should, you should be confident that these health and safety protocols are in place. But finally, our, our point of advocacy is the importance of continued government support for the sector for all of these economic and social benefits that we've talked about, but also because to talk about a recovery, we have to still have an industry that's there. 
Um, and the industry has been badly hit. We've seen lots and lots of redundancies. But what you've seen have been mainly the big companies, the airlines, the big hotel chains and so on. You have to remember that 80% of travel and tourism companies are SMEs. So maintaining government, maintaining measures, financial measures to enable liquidity of those businesses, uh, but investing in tourism from governments and tourism boards and promoting travel and tourism is, is going to be fundamental. So that's where, uh, coming back to your, your question, a long way, long, long way to get back to your question, but governments have to be reinvesting in travel and tourism, making sure that the health and safety protocols are in, are in place, but promoting destinations. And we've all got to be promoting the success stories because the more, more people begin to travel, the more that will encourage other people to travel and we can, we can get this uh, snowball effect and, and a multiplier effect going. Um, but of course, it's all back to the, the medical situation and whether there are second waves, second signs. Okay, thank you. Andreas. Great, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'll talk about uh, Greece and then we can uh, obviously generalize. Uh, uh, tourism accounts for about 20% of uh, Greek GDP, so it's of utmost importance for us to uh, have uh, uh, tourism uh, starting again. Uh, our government took uh, very strict measures back in uh, March and April. We had a total uh, lockdown uh, and uh, I think that we managed to um, sort of successfully uh, uh, manage the uh, hygiene part of uh, uh, the pandemic and now we're trying to uh, capitalize on that the very idea is to uh, build a, a brand name around uh, being a safe country and inviting people to, to come back and uh, uh, obviously you know many people who would like to uh, come to Greece right now are those that some um, I call revenge travelers some of these are people that uh, uh, would like to use uh, uh, travel uh, as a, a step uh, forwards towards you know returning back to, to normality the very idea is that um, they don't want to change their lifestyle travel is part of a lifestyle and they want to um, uh, you know go back to the uh, usual habits just to show that uh, uh, they gain their life back from uh, COVID-19 at the same time we, we have to be very careful as a as a country as a destination not to become victims of our, our own success uh, because uh, if you end up having uh, too many tourists and uh, if uh, safety and hygiene protocols are not properly observed, uh, we may end up having a second wave of a pandemic sooner than expected. And interestingly, uh, only yesterday, our government decided to um, 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 introduce uh, new uh, restrictions uh, against flights uh, in and out of uh, Serbia, between Serbia and Greece. Currently, there is a uh, a big outbreak of COVID-19 in, in Serbia and therefore the government, our government decided to uh, stop accepting uh, um, direct flights from Serbia and uh, uh, this is to the detriment of uh, tourism in the northern part of Greece which very uh, heavily relies on tourism from the Baltic state. So obviously uh, there is a, a cloud of uncertainty, it's a matter of how we can uh, implement all these uh, safety and hygiene uh, protocols, it's uh, a matter of um, um, instigating and uh, making sure that uh, uh, confidence uh, is uh, uh, of primary importance. But then we also have some technical issues like uh, travel insurance, for example. A uh, big number of uh, uh, tourists that visit uh, Greece uh, uh, are uh, typically sea and sand tourists, uh, uh, buying uh, holiday packages offered by tour operators. Um, uh, tour operators uh, make it mandatory for the clients uh, to buy travel insurance. And then it's a matter of whether uh, travel insurers uh, uh, properly um, insure people against uh, COVID-19 and who is going to uh, uh, pay the toll in case something happens. And then you, you may have uh, various legal issues. So uh, uh, if, for example, you have a, a, a tour operator buying seats uh, on an airline that does not belong to a tour operator, and uh, if you have a, a, a passenger of that tour operator properly insured, uh, uh, but not having the other passengers on board insured, if something happens, uh, who would be uh, to blame? So uh, there's still a number of uh, unresolved issues related to travel insurance, and all these can make um, destination management very, very difficult. Uh, just to uh, close, in, in my opinion, and talking about destination management, we may have to rethink about the model forward, and uh, uh, we all know how uh, different revenue management uh, techniques are uh, 
uh, implemented in the uh, aviation sector and also in uh, other parts of uh, uh, tourism, including hospitality and so on. Um, so far, we, we can't really talk about uh, a revenue management model for destinations, but from now onwards, we may have to uh, think about this very seriously. And um, uh, the very idea of using uh, DDMMOs, that's Destination Development Management and Marketing Organization, very important. I think they should take the lead in terms of um, uh, streamlining uh, stakeholders' views and see how we could possibly uh, raise uh, uh, per capita tourism expenditure and be in a position to uh, raise the overall level of revenue even with uh, uh, fewer tourists. Because um, what seems to um, come up as a priority number one out of the current pandemic is congestion, how we can deal with congestion, how we can deal with social distancing. So if you want to survive and possibly prosper as a destination with uh, 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 fewer uh, tourists, then you may have to uh, uh, rethink about your mass tourism model and how you can possibly uh, increase uh, uh, um, per, per capita receipt. Okay, thank you. Now Air connectivity is, of course, key. It's fundamental to tourism. And Brian has already mentioned that that is being challenged. And we've seen that there are airlines which have suffered strongly. Friday was the first to collapse in March. Air Mauritius is in administration. Virgin Australia in administration. Are we going to see more airlines going fast? Because on the one hand, Brian, in the chat, you 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 mentioned that the cost of operation is going to go up because of the extra health checks but at the same time because the number of passengers are going down so that of course strongly affect profitability so is the market going to be consolidated with fewer operators i think it probably will um i mean if anything the surprising thing is that we've not seen very many airlines going into bankruptcy or chapter 11 restructuring i mean i mean we've seen a few in latin america uh recently that's because there hasn't really been much government aid for the industry in in latin america um globally there's been a lot i mean actually governments have provided more than 120 billion dollars of aid to to airlines um a lot of that has been through wage subsidies and uh, as we know that's being phased out and i think that um you know we haven't really seen the financial difficulties that the industry and it's not just airlines it'll be others because a lot of that aid has been through debt which will have to be serviced and repaid um some of the support to airlines for instance um air navigation charges have been deferred but they're going to have to be paid so i think the difficult part financially is going to be for airlines and probably other companies in the tourism value chain as they start operations again as these government aid and subsidies drop away they're faced with quite high costs at operating at a smaller scale uh, with a customer base that probably you know needs you know low prices to stimulate them it's going to be i think inevitably we're going to see a lot of failures um which is perhaps not surprising in some markets like europe which is very fragmented anyway um you know so there may be some sensible rationalization taking taking place but actually even strong companies are, are struggling um at, at the moment so the worry would be is that we lose some very well-run companies um at the at, at the same time it's going to be a, a, a tricky period um uh, in this recovery until we get a much stronger market, which I think will be a little way away. Sharon, would you like to add something to this regarding connectivity with uh, uh, to seashells? Like, how are the airlines working with the destination to make sure that that's happening, it's well connected? Um, uh, for us, uh, um, uh, Seychelles connectivity, I would believe, uh, as part of the recovery is key. Um, Air Seychelles, our national airline, um, so far, um, uh, will probably be one of the lifeline for the industry. 
um, our main market is from Europe. This is where uh, um, 60 odd percent of our visitors come from. And uh, if all fails, uh, that would be the absolute lifeline. And uh, um, Seychelles is actually um, state owned and has been uh, receiving support from the government for uh, uh, um, every year actually and and that's actually one of the main reason why the government keeps supporting the airline for time like this when you actually need need a national airline to help you with the rebound of your tourism industry um before the um, the covid crisis we had 14 airlines serving the destination and uh, we totally uh, do not foresee that uh, after this we will we will immediately have 14 airlines serving us back though i have to say part of of the recovery it is absolutely crucial that we are able to establish airlines with our market um, if we want that to to happen and uh, um, so we are looking at all possible um, options we have a few um, especially the middle eastern carrier are the ones which actually have confirmed to um, uh, connect uh, connect uh, us with uh, with a few of our source markets but here we are looking at possibility of charters um, if possible to connect us and uh, we've already started discussions with our um, we we are a destination which is still quite strong with two operators and uh, um, so this is this is where um, working um, collaboratively collaboratively together with uh, um, your various tourism partners to be able to to, to build back restart tourism um, so for us being an island um, say within Europe there's different ways of, of, of getting to to a country you don't rely solely on airlines you can do it by a train you can drive there but for Seychelles being isolated there's, there's absolutely one way to get there and this is by plane and, and air connectivity is key. And uh, I forgot to mention, we depend 66% indirectly on, on tourism. So it's, uh, it's essential that we are able to get all these key um, element um, to, to fit in back um, to the puzzle to be able to restart tourism. Okay. Jeff, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of points. I mean, I, I think it's important to understand here that, that businesses don't go bust on day one. They're, they're like, they're like, they're, they're like us, us all in a way, you know, you can be out of a job for three or four months and you can survive that, but you know, six months or whatever else is, is quite difficult. We have to bear in mind that most businesses have, have been dead for, for three months now. So we're in that kind of touch and go situation for, for many businesses in, in travel and tourism. And so again, back to my point, you know, if we don't get, travel and tourism up and running fairly soon, then we'll see an increasing number of companies going out of business. And it's important to understand that there are, it's such a diverse industry with, with, a, with a very, very long value chain um, and also different sizes of, of businesses from one to two people to huge airlines and hotels. So all, all parts of that ecosystem play a role and we need to make sure that they're all there in some format uh, later on. The other important point I think here is to recognize seasonality in the, in the industry. And it's why the European Commission and European governments have been under so much pressure to open borders and re-begin travel in Europe because of the summer season in, northern, in the Northern Hemisphere. And if the industry misses that summer season, which provides its finances for the rest of the year, then you'll see a lot of businesses uh, go, go out. And it'll be the same in, in other parts of the world, but perhaps less so because the seasons are, are different there. So there are a lot of elements pl playing in here, in here, I believe, but uh, we should not underestimate the fragility of so many businesses in, in the industry. Would anybody want to add something or Andreas, yeah. yes? Um, thank you, Nilu. I think we're also uh, currently experiencing a kind of paradox, meaning that some, uh, many people would like to uh, uh, go to sort of isolated places because uh, it's easier to observe social distancing and having less congestion there. At the same time, uh, those isolated places do not have uh, 
uh, direct uh, uh, flights. Huh? And what we've seen currently in Greece is that um, uh, those islands that uh, uh, you know rely on traditional markets like uh, uh, Germany or France or uh, at some stage uh, uh, UK when uh, uh, direct flights will be uh, uh, back on, uh, they are likely to suffer less compared to um, uh, a number of islands which uh, do not have uh, direct services uh, uh, to a major uh, origin countries of tourism. So ha having direct services is important from um, a possibly longer term uh, trend. We, we may also have to um, make some observations about uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, hubbing versus dehubbing. Huh? So what we saw, for example, with uh, low cost carriers is that they challenge the very idea of um, the hub and spoke network by introducing uh, point to point services. Also, in many cases, with smaller aircraft, uh, in order to uh, uh, have higher um, uh, utilization factors, load factors. So the issue now is uh, uh, whether people would like to, um, uh, you know, put more emphasis in uh, in direct flights, avoid uh, uh, big hubs, uh, because uh, you know, if you get indirect flights, obviously uh, you, you get some more exposure to uh, potential. Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, cases. So if people end up preferring direct flights instead of indirect flights, uh, and if they end up preferring a smaller aircraft instead of, let's say, flying on an A320 uh, or an A380 or, uh, you know, another very big uh, Boeing aircraft, let's say, the uh, 777 or whatever, again, uh, this may have important um, uh, implications, uh, not only for network configuration, but also for uh, uh, fleet configuration and uh, uh, the whole uh, business model that is going to be used by Erlang. Of course, everything may prove temporary, but if this proves to be a longer term issue, uh, I think we may see some uh, uh, big shakeups in the industry as a result of uh, these changes as well. And that's provided a very good transition to my next question, which was going to be about regional airports, because what we're seeing in the UK, like we've tried the out of market, that creates difficulty for Southampton. Be pulling out of Gatwick, Ryanair pulling out of Gatwick and Newcastle. So this is putting the regional airlines into difficulties, which then means the connectivity is not there, like the hub and spoke. So it is forcing people to travel more towards Heathrow than to go to regional airlines. So how, how would that change the face of travel, especially in Europe? Who will jump in? Anyone? Brian? Okay. Um, I, I think I think you're you're right uh, that we're going to see uh, travel travel nodes, or, or uh, we, we're going to see a concentration um, uh, because air, airlines are going to have to, you know, the market is going to be much smaller at least for a few years. I think it, it, we will get a recovery. I'm sure we'll get a recovery. Certainly, you know, if and when we get a vaccine, uh, we'll get a proper proper recovery. But I think the sort of our best guess estimate at the moment is that you know, we're going to have several years of much smaller market. So for many airports that rely on, um, on connecting passengers, um, the, so the smaller hubs, I think are going to really suffer um, initially, I think there'll be a concentration. We've seen we've seen this already happening with some airlines, uh, you know, leaving some of their smaller hubs and concentrating, just to get a viable flow of passengers to to, to try to make the economics uh, work. Um, and uh, I guess the other point at the moment is that we don't really know yet where the demand is. Um, obviously, many markets are not open yet. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we, someone was talking about revenue management um, earlier, I think it was Andreas. Um, I think the airlines have thrown their revenue management models out of the window because they just don't work at, at the moment. And it's interesting, you know, a lot of people are turning to new sources of data. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the, the interest of uh, consumers in travel that are revealed through Google searches. Um, you know, there's a lot of new data sources and mobility um, uh, measures uh, as, as well. So I, I think we're having to sort of rewrite the analysis rule book um, to 
try and uh, get an idea of where the demand is is coming and it's i think it's that limited demand that means that you know a number of airports and the regional airports in particular um you know are, are going to struggle i think for at least for a while Yes, yeah, I'd just like to add to what Brian's saying, because I think um, one important issue here it will be the dynamics of domestic tourism opening first. Because as Brian was saying, you know, the, the regional airports and the regional communities are generally in, in danger of losing, losing connectivity. But if domestic tourism uh, takes off to the extent that we think it will in, in, in the short term, that will help in each country to maintain the, that regional connectivity until until the global the global tourism comes back. Um, again, the point here is, you know, everything's got everything's got to work together, public and private sector cooperation, uh, because you know th th there's no point in uh, in supporting uh, uh, travel and tourism in local areas if if the tourists can't get there. Or, 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 or vice versa, supporting airlines when there isn't a demand. So having this close um, cooperation for opening up and seeing how things go uh, is going to be really important. And I think you know people use expressions like the new reality or the new normal, um, and the answer, the real answer, is that nobody actually knows. So we're going to have to have a lot more agility in business models and how governments operate and. How What's, what's supported and not supported than, than we've ever seen before. And, and nobody has a template because this hasn't happened before. And um, last, last week, the African Union Commission was talking about um, African uh, aviation and tourism. And they announced that they were going to focus on free instrument, free measures, that was price, taxes, and visa regulations in order to stimulate the African market. Now, do you think, how, how viable do you think those measures would be? Should the rest of the world still also be looking at that? We've, we've touched up prices a bit, and I think, Jeff, you mentioned visa earlier, very briefly. So what, what, what are your views on that? Um, well, I, I, again, I, be, I believe that um, um, governments have to act in a very coordinated way here um, and, and be able to look at what they can do to stimulate demand, removing visas, providing support, uh, helping the local communities is, is going to be key. And again, that goes down to making sure that you know, very small businesses in certain communities are kept going, not just big, the big players. Um, but Every government will have to look very carefully at its, at its travel and tourism industry and its aviation connectivity and so on, because they're going to be so critical to the way forward. Um, and again, to use the, the old adage, the, the one, there's no one size fits all solution here. So what is happening, e even within Africa, the, 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 the countries and the destinations are so diverse that the situations are going to be very different um, as, as well. Um, but you know, there's a big role to play here for the uh, multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, and so on. And we've been talking to them a lot about not just making packages, of, big money packages available to government, but being specific and helping governments how best to use that, use the money, what should be the targets in travel and tourism and elsewhere, but also how to get the money to the people that need it. Because in the short term, the biggest problem with government measures on COVID-19 is, 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 is it's not been flowing down to the, to the people that need it most because the, because the processes and the pipelines are, are simply not, haven't been there. Um, so again, there's a lot of good work that can be done here by the international community, working with the government, working with the local communities, uh, and, and with the, uh, the private sector involved as well. The, the African Union Commission is also looking into um, developing the regional market because um, it was announced that COVID was more of an economic problem than a health problem in Africa. So maybe by stimulating intra-Africa travel, they were going to 
help the industry and therefore these would be some of the measures they think which is going to help now brian also mentioned the domestic market in china is starting to show some vibrancy so do you think eventually we are going to see more regional travel like if asia suddenly becomes more uh, virus free a few regions so you would see intra-asia travel or european travels in europe and northern america traveling in northern american countries so are we going to see little pockets of travel regional travel i think we're already seeing that aren't we um i mean as jeff mentioned you know it's the domestic markets that have opened up first as economies un unlocked and you know some of the, in some of those markets we've seen very strong growth you know vietnam and iraq uh, those markets are back to pre-crisis levels um you know the asian markets and actually more recently europe we've start, started to see some good increases in domestic uh travel but in, in international travel it's really been the the development of these travel corridors travel bubbles you know we've had china uh with singapore and um and korea talking about green uh, lanes and open for business travel. Um, you know, they've, I, I think it's essentially trust that uh, is driving this at the moment. And countries need to be able to trust that they're not importing COVID-19 cases. Um, I think that we've gone a long way with the successful um, protocols that have been issued by um, ICAO um, and are starting to be implemented uh, by governments, we need to, you know we we basically need a consistent set of uh, of protocols um, that mean that it, it governments know that um, it is safe to open their markets uh, overseas. Inevitably, I think um, we're going to see this uh, just taking place uh, with neighbouring countries in, initially. Um, and then I would imagine it would, it would it would slowly spread. I think the long haul destinations, you know, maybe the last um, to follow, unless we're successful in you know persuading a consistent uh, adoption of these um, of these of these measures. Mm. Is Lilu with us? I think she's dropped off, Andreas. Well, perhaps I'll perhaps I'll just add 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 so we keep the conversation going. I mean, I agree okay, absolutely yeah. with I agree absolutely with uh, Brian there. And for me, it comes back to this fundamental point about the re-establishing the confidence of the traveller uh, to travel. We we know that everybody still has wanderlust. Um, we just need to we just need to enable them to do that. And I think it's fairly clear in most uh, forecasters believe that domestic will open up first and then regional, and then international travel, and then intercontinental travel. And finally, probably the big, may, will big business conferences ever come back? May, maybe not. But the key to that, the key to that is re-establishing the, the confidence to travel with the protocols, that it is safe to travel, that borders are open, and, um, uh, and uh, active promotion like the, uh, the back cloth that Neela has there, Neelu has there at the moment, says I, I want to I want I want to go to that that, that place you know? and so promotion work is going to be important otherwise you get that long slow recovery domestic to regional to international and 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 it will take much longer for travel and tourism and aviation to rebuild and hence the global economy to rebuild um, I think at the same time we have to be very careful with uh, the whole idea of staycation huh? this is a term developed about um, 10, 15 years ago when we had the uh, big uh, financial crisis in Europe and uh, at that time uh, many people could not afford to uh, take uh, uh, holidays in uh, soundless destinations like Greece or uh, Spain or Portugal and they decided to uh, uh, spend their vacation at home. So now we see a second wave of um, staycation uh, which is to some extent related to the uh, economic recession but also to um, um, the whole, uh, you know, safety and hygiene concerns that uh, relate to international travel. And um, I think that makes sense, but we have to be very careful not to have a, a kind of a protectionism, a new wave of protectionism uh, related to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, staycation becoming 
a new fashion um, because um, if we look at economic history, whenever we had big recessions, um, unfortunately states did not act in a coordinated uh, way. They acted in, uh, in many cases in unilateral uh, ways, uh, just trying to uh, create uh, uh, fortresses and, and uh, get involved in, in protection. So uh, COVID-19 is, is an international pro problem. We need um, uh, a global solution, as, as everybody rightly said, we, we need uh, collaboration and coordination uh, and not fragmented solutions. So uh, uh, staycation may be around for a while, but um, hopefully uh, international travel should open again uh, to the benefit of uh, everyone, I think. Okay, so and it's, important, it's important to know, understand that, that uh, about three quarters of, uh, of travel and tourism is actually domestic. But the issue is that domestic uh, tourists spend much less than, than international ones. And so the, stake, the, the staycation uh, means that people still go on holiday, but the, the economic impact um, may be at home, but it won't be as big for the, for the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, um, if I would talk a little bit about uh, Seychelles and probably all the islands that would be, would be similar. Mm -hmm. It was important during that um, that process of, of the lockdown and tourism having gone to zero to continuously monitor demand and supply both because you, you need both for, for the recovery. Yeah. And what uh, uh, Jeff shared about uh, the tourism board had to find creative ways to keep the dream alive because you know people are confined, they cannot travel. It was really important to keep people dreaming um, because that is, is an, a, a very important part in the recovery is that you, you want people to want to travel, um, especially when they are in confinement, you know that uh, the... Uh, when you cannot have something you want, you, you want it more. So, so for us, and I've seen a lot of destinations, uh, Greece have been doing it beautifully, is keep people dreaming until they are able to travel. And uh, of course, on the supply side, this is where the domestic tourism or staycation comes in. It's a way for businesses to sustain themselves. They have fixed costs that they cannot escape from. And um, having a little bit of revenue is better than nothing and this is where um, for Seychelles, even with uh, a small population, um, a lot of businesses, tourism businesses, um, have found it as, a, as, a, as ways and means to be able to generate a little bit of revenue and keep themselves going while they wait for international tourism um, to pick up. But definitely it should not be a replacement for international tourism because again, the revenue generated from uh, domestic tourism does not compensate for what uh, uh, the country was collecting from international tourism. And while you keep on monitoring demand, you need to see what are the new trends developing. And uh, for example, um, while we no long haul destination, um, in the case of Seychelles, we pick up uh, Last, um, we also know there are segments who are much more inclined to travel to long haul destination. And this is a bit much more like the luxury segment. And uh, um, you don't need the big numbers, but you need a few who'd be able to at least compensate a little bit with, the, with their spending in the, in the destination. And this is where um, for us opening the first um, stage with uh, private jets, for example, um, has helped a bit because um, then um, um, as you would see, this is uh, anybody monitoring um, what's happening globally in terms of aviation. Um, the surge in demands in terms of uh, um, private uh, private charter, um, it's more in demand now, more than ever. And uh, um, when you look about um, uh, the, the trend as well, it's showing uh, in terms of the luxury segment, again, um, families, um, extended families are joining because they've been separated during the lockdown, are joining together, so chartering a plane with the families to travel to some destination. And this is where, again, destinations have to relook a little bit at their product. Um, crowded holiday sites um, will not be in demand, but they would have to reinvent themselves, look for ways to, 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 to appeal to the new, the, the new trend developing. This is where you want to be more secluded. People want more privacy. Um, they want more isolation. Well. 
for Seychelles, it, it, we tick all the boxes in that manner. But uh, for other destinations, there's a lot of thoughts they will need to start. Uh, um, you just really need to monitor what the con, our potential consumer, what the the today's traveler would want, and and we would need to adapt if we we need if we want tourism to rebound, if we want uh, um, our destination to to restart. It will have to be this way. Okay, so I'll open the questions to the to our guests now. Anybody want to ask a question? Charidimos, you had a few questions in the chat. Would you like to ask in person? You'll have to unmute yourself. No? Okay. So First questions from the audience. What about workation? We can work from everywhere with the widespread new telecommunication. I'm also wondering why am I not in Mauritius and teaching in Leeds? And so how do you think this is going to happen? I could be in Mauritius right now. So how um, how is that affect travel? I think it's uh, it's it's uh, it's part of the our line of thinking here um, because we are we are looking for longer stay now part of the strategy is really um, uh, try to target people to, to come for two months three months six months why not um, to the islands and if you can work remotely why can't it be an option as well we already have a quite a, a, a good number of, of tourists who did not travel back home um, uh, when uh, uh, there was the various uh, travel restrictions. They chose to stay in Seychelles and because uh, most of them, uh, they, they were able to manage uh, their business from, from Seychelles. So for them, it, they felt safer to stay back home than to travel um, back to, to where their home is. And uh, so for us, it's, it's really, we, we, we are looking vacation definitely it's a potential but also retired um, retired uh, um, people who, who probably want to just uh, um, go away for three months uh, um, and and just be somewhere secluded private um, and uh, um, so it it is it is something we, we are working on and we are looking um, for people three months, six months. So instead of having the, the big numbers coming in and out, in and out on a weekly basis, if somebody is coming for longer term, you provide um, the benefits for them to stay home um, that longer. And it's definitely uh, other, for other destinations, it's something for them to consider. Yeah. Any other questions from our, anybody wants to add to that? Oh yeah, I'd just like just just like to add one point that I think we need we need to bear in mind that the the business travel and leisure travel businesses are very different and have very different um, economic business models. And I think we can all we can all see that we would we've been talking about the leisure sector really when we've been talking about encouraging people to travel. But I think all of us would would recognise that uh, business travel is most unlikely to go back to what it used to be. Um, and that's where the money has been for airlines. Everybody knows that an, a, a, airlines make money out of the front end of the aircraft, not the back. But it's also the same for um, hotels and other, and other parts of the travel and tourism industry. So if the business end um, doesn't pick up in the same way, it has a, a, it has a disproportionate effect on the, on the overall economies across aviation and, and travel and tourism. So uh, it's it's a very really interesting question. Um, I guess I guess the answer is we all want to work from home, but everybody else should travel and benefit the economy. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Jeff. Um, and and it's a real uncertainty. I don't think we really know. I, I, you know, for 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 decades, uh, people have predicting predicting that um, you know, video conferencing was the death of business travel. Um, Interestingly, you know, it never has been. I, I guess the question is, you know, because we've all found that remote working can work, uh, will will we have reached that tipping point, or or is it that actually, even for for business uh, meetings, actually being face to face with somebody um, is still important. Um, and I wonder, you know, we were talking to McKinsey about this. You know, McKinsey have certainly changed their business travel policy 
largely because they've seen that this can work, but they think it's going to actually make them more productive uh, and that they'll be able to speak to far more clients uh, on the video, but then they're going to need to travel to do the deal or to, so I'm, you know, uh, clearly business travel is going to be down a lot at the beginning because of the, the recession. The recession. Um, I don't think it's the end of it yet, though. Um, hello. And yeah. I think that uh, PCOs, professional uh, Congress organizers, and TMCs, the big uh, travel management companies, should now come with a more aggressive narrative, exactly supporting what uh, Brian has just said that basically you can do things online, but uh, uh, a virtual conference cannot really. Uh, uh, be a, a great substitute for uh, for a, a real conference because uh, uh, you can do online networking, but it's not the same as uh, uh, when you have a face-to-face -face meeting. So um, in the short term, it's um, most likely that business travel will go down. We, we, we should not forget that um, COVID-19 will uh, obviously um, have very negative repercussions on the economy as well. So uh, uh, whenever you experience an economic recession, uh, business travel goes down anyway, but I think it's uh, about building an aggressive narrative that face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, cannot be uh, substituted. And online is good, but uh, uh, cannot be uh, uh, the only way forward. Okay, we have a few questions regarding redistribution of wealth, and uh, the like. COVID is hitting the poorer more. Is that a concern for travel and tourism? And also, if the market changes, what kind of implication would that have with distribution of wealth? Like if we no longer have people from Europe, from the richer country traveling to the poorer countries, it will have a much bigger impact on the economy of this um, richer, um, poorer country that it would normally have at home. So anybody wants to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's it's a very real issue because um, by definition, uh, lower paid people are much less resilient to uh, the sort of crisis that we're seeing now. And by the way, are the first to be laid off, uh, um, as etc. Um, but it also twists back the the other other way that a lot of these uh, lower paid workers are indeed in the in the travel and, and tourism industry, um, you know, uh, uh, supporting cleaning hotels, uh, you know, operational people in different establishments and so on. So again, the point is, if we want to help those people, then getting travel and tourism back up and running is going to be a, a major element there. Um, the second second issue is the question of visas and immigration policies here as well, because in many places in Europe, for example, those low paid workers have come from other other parts of the world or Eastern Europe into Western Europe. They're migrant workers who are who are the lower paid people. And again, if we don't get those jobs going, you're not really beginning to turn the wheels of the the economy and help and helping those low paid people who have been uh, most adversely affected. Yeah, perhaps if I could add also, um, yeah, I, I think I think we all ought to be worried about um, the you know the, the developing economies, um, the the lower income e economies. I mean, it's not just that tourism is a key driver for many of those e economies. I mean, the impact of COVID is also going to be that um, companies are going to pull their supply chains back home and. You know, the global supply chains have been actually quite an important component of economic development, of spreading um, economic activity ar around uh, around the world. Um, you know, these are the economies, as we're seeing with support for the tourism and the airline industry. Um, you know, it's least in those countries that actually don't have the capacity um, to to do it. So I think. Um, COVID-19 is going to have important distributional effects. It will, you know, uh, disproportionately affect the poor and poorer countries and set back um, development unless, you know, we can act ourselves and get governments to act to offset that.
Nilo, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question is to do with sustainability. Given that now we have a very, um, there's a lot of pressure to create jobs. Like in England, we're expecting to have 10% unemployment over 3 million people unemployed. Do you think government are going to relax their commitment to more sustainable practices regarding travel and tourism? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, we've certainly seen this in Europe. Uh, indeed, you know, uh, government aid um, in Europe has in many cases had green strings attached to it. Um, you know, in, in, some, some of, in, in some European countries, you know, there's been a requirement not to fly short distance routes where um, rail can substitute. Um, there's been some requirements to hit uh, certain sustainability uh, targets. Um, I think it's a really interesting question because after the global financial crisis, I think it was true that the climate concerns were put on the back burner. Um, I really don't think that's going to happen uh, this this time. I think it's going to have to be an industry that is more sustainable. Um, you know, as as I say, as as we've seen a number of governments um, insist. Okay. Yes, Andreas. Yeah, I'd just like to add to what Brian has said because I think I think we need to understand that the pressure on sustainability will not just come from governments that are going to turn up, get, just give up on environmental issues. It's going to come from from the general public and, and the travellers because people have got used to seeing uh, nice nice blue skies, noise levels in cities have gone down. You know the the quality of life has gone up gone up, but also they're much more acutely aware of issues like food waste and use use of plastics uh, in in travel and tourism so we we see that the the traveler will be much more demanding for sustainable tourism than has traditionally been the case so you'll see you know a government pressure from one side to meet uh, carbon targets uh, and, and, and other things but you'll see the the, the traveler themselves wanting to uh, ensure that their 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 travel is sustainable um so it's a, it's very much from a wttc point of view it's very much a, a core part of our of our, our members strategy in in rebuilding uh, travel and tourism um and and some of our ceos are arguing that actually there's a real opportunity here because it's much easier to introduce and implement sustainable practices when you're rebuilding a business from zero, than it is to that it is to sort of stick it on when a business is is fully running and growing, uh, as was happening in, in previous years. Uh, it's an interesting theory. I think we'll see what happens. But uh, I mean, I think the, the answer to the question is sustainability is here to stay and will become more and more important, not not go away. Okay. Yes, Andreas. Uh, I think that uh, re-engineering the uh, destination business model becomes of uh, great importance now. As I said earlier, a number of destinations may look uh, at how they can uh, generate uh, more revenue with uh, uh, fewer tourists. Uh, at the same time, the big challenge there is how we can um, somehow uh, balance this with the uh, so-called democratization of tourism. Because after the, uh, the Second World War, uh, democratization of tourism, mass tourism was uh, one of the big uh, pillars in terms of uh, how uh, uh, everybody can be included. It was a matter of social inclusiveness. Uh, now we're talking about sustainability, which is very, very important. But if uh, sustainability comes at an extra cost, uh, then who is going to bear the cost? And we have to see whether uh, this may act as a mechanism of exclusion of uh, a certain um, uh, you know, social groups from enjoying tourism and that brings us back to your previous question Nilu about uh, uh, social inclusion versus exclusion and what happens with uh, uh, the poorer segments of the society where they're, they're going to be adversely affected by this new wave of uh, sustainability. Okay, can I just add that? Yeah, yeah, Sherry, Sherry? Um, uh, very short, I, I believe uh, what, uh, what we've seen also from um, this time of confinement, um, people have grown the desire to, um, to reconnect. 
um, and we've seen this come out in a lot of researchers reconnect uh, reconnect with themselves reconnect with families but very importantly also reconnect with nature this is uh, um, when you deprive from something it again coming back to um, talking a little bit about the psychology of uh, being deprived from things this is when you you feel um, you've taken for granted um, the fresh air, um, the clear water. Um, the I, I saw this actually in the news when um, China um, reopened. Um, uh, so people were allowed to go out to parks and to places. And I saw uh, the interview of people just taking a, a, a breath of fresh air felt like a... Um, it was a big thing and it, it's things that you do every day and consciously and not realize so i think what has uh, another trend which has which i believe will emerge is, is people wanting to connect more with uh, with uh, what mother nature has given us and probably it's the time for 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 us now to 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 build um uh, build our our awareness on, on the issue of climate change, on the need for conservation, and hopefully get people to transform as a while. Um, psychologically, they are they've been they, they've been they've been affected by this whole process, and and they are more aware of uh, of the need to be um, in nature, to be appreciative of nature, to use this as an opportunity as well, um, um, to push a little bit uh, um, our concern with regards to climate change, because if we we think um, COVID is, has really affected the world. I'm just um, telling everybody, let's wave for the climate change wave that will come. This is even bigger and more significant because at least COVID, you can see it right now. It's like this thing that has happened just suddenly. But climate change, I see it as the bigger wave. It's like the tidal wave above COVID. So I think it's an opportunity now for us to really pass the message um, um, even stronger. I think it's, a, it's more than ever now. We should not relax on our um, efforts to talk about sustainability. Tourism is an industry which should be sustainable. We should not be saying sustainable tourism. I think that would be a very good, bring us a good transition to tomorrow's workshop because tomorrow Gaz has another workshop similar panel, which is specifically on issues related to sustainability of the industry. But we have time now for the closing remark. We've come almost to an end. 90 minutes went so fast. Thank you very much to everyone. So can I ask each of our panel member, Jeff, can you have a closing remark, each one of you? Um. I hadn't thought about it, but I think it's been a very interesting discussion. And I think uh, we've ended up on a, on a very good point here about sustainability versus mass tourism. Um, yes. And we've got to get, it's, it's a little bit like what we're struggling with at the moment with health considerations against opening up businesses and everything else. We're, we're in a new, um, a new set of dynamics here that the world is gonna have to find its way through. But ultimately, ultimately, we have to find a balance between these things. Um, but I couldn't agree more with uh, Sharon. I think uh, we're just looking at the problem that we have in front of us today um, and how the, how the world's going to change as a result of COVID-19. But it's nothing like what we have to, we have to change uh, to address the climate issues. And, and that is what the younger generation in particular is concerned about. So I think all of these are, are very, very interesting points for discussion. You could probably have uh, webinars for the rest of the year on this. Thank you. Thank you for involving me. Thank you, Jeff. Brian. Um, just, just a quick remark on, um, I mean, I think over the last 20 years, we've seen the cost of air travel halve in real terms. That's been behind the democratization uh, that's, that's happened. I wonder if we're at a turning point. Um, you know, if, if the health measures are not, just temporary we're going to see a lot of more cost um, climate uh, issues are going to mean that uh, air travel is going to get more costly and one thing we haven't really talked about is that um, the environment that we we lived in over the last 20 years that helped generate those lower uh, lower fares was one of liberalization 
And I think we're in a very difficult, different political environment now, partly as a result of COVID, where we're, we're sort of turning in and becoming a much more protectionist, nationalist uh, politics. Um, so I, I fear that we won't have the opening up of, uh, of markets, which were so helpful in bringing um, you know, bringing uh, prices uh, prices down, but you know, given the sustainability needs, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, uh, I believe, uh, um, uh, as, uh, as an industry, aviation and tourism, we just have to adapt um, and adopt new ways of doing things um, for us to for us to survive this and for us to get back on our feet and i think as human beings we are very intelligent creature and uh, we've survived many many waves in the past and i think this is another phase where we will rise from it um, like i said we just need to adapt and adopt new measures and i think it's a set of skills that will help us fight this climate change issues as well because uh, um, learning to live in a new normal now it would be something that we will need for the future okay. Andrea. Uh, i think that the uh, covid19 pandemic showed us how we can go from an over tourism uh, situation to uh, down to a zero tourism situation and uh, the idea of opening up again is uh, very much related to uh, proper destination management. And in the past, many destinations thought that we can uh, run things on a kind of an autopilot and everything will be somehow uh, ensured as a result of the uh, invisible hand or magic hand, whatever you want to call it. Now I think it's time for um, a proper streamlining of a different stakeholders' interests. It's very important for uh, destinations to uh, come in for foreground and uh, uh, see how can we can promote the sustainable future by taking into consideration the needs and wants of uh, everyone, of the, the entire ecosystem. So thank you very much. I think it was a profoundly interesting discussion and the panel, um, thank you to the panel. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Brian, Sharon and Andreas. Thank you for thank everything you. we've learned from you. And our guests also say it was very interesting. So we can, if you're interested in sustainability that's happening tomorrow and we're not doing too bad on time so thank you and goodbye thank, thank you. you thank you okay.